This message is part of the teaching provided by House on the Rock Fellowship, a church caring for the Miami Valley region. Before you listen, be sure to access the notes in the download section of the message page. Have a Bible ready. Thank you for being our guest. The snow fell. For us who are from western Pennsylvania, it was a gift from home. For you, it was hell unleashed. But for us, oh, to see the snow fall, we're getting out the snow suits and we're getting out the gloves, the ski gloves and the ski caps and the boots because we're going to go sledding and we're going to head to the levee and we grab the giant Norwegian five-person toboggan and we go, we're going to go sledding down the levee because that's really the only place to go anywhere is to the levee. And when we got there, Hey, it was virgin snow. No one had been there. Everyone was probably still in their driveways. But <laughs> we, we were the only ones at the whole levee. We had the whole place to ourselves. So we all, we got the toboggan set and we got all five of us and our family on there. I'm up front because I get it done when it comes to, this, to riding the toboggan down. You want me to make the path. Also because the kickback then goes up over my girthy frame and it protects the whole family behind me. So we go down and we make that run a few times and oh, we're just having so much fun. The kids are running sides and eventually, you know, it was time to go home. It was time to go. And we were okay. We had our, our hand warmers and our hats and, and our snow clothes. We were, we were dressed for success. On our way to the car, we parked over uh, by Hobart, okay? On our way back to the car, we noticed four good old boys get out of a pickup truck. With the lids to Rubbermaid totes. <laughs> now... Don't judge me, but I did feel a little superior as I stood there with my giant toboggan. I'm like, what's up, boys? <laughs> they had the Rubbermaid lid in this hand, and they had their sixer in the other. <laughs> and I don't know that they really thought too much about what they were going to wear. Some had boots, some didn't. I think most of them had pants on. But it's somewhere through the course of the celebrating of snow coming, someone said, let's go to the levee and let's go sledding. And so they grab, is, is sledding on lids a thing here in Western Ohio? Is that what you guys do? Whatever you can find. Okay, I, I get that. I, I mean, I don't because I have a toboggan, but that's okay. <laughs> But here's the thing. We're walking back to the car. We're still on the upper path uh, on the levee. And one of them has decided he's going to be the first one. And so he's getting up speed, which I was pretty impressed for him because I don't know that that morning was thing. He wasn't thinking about, but he, and this was amazing. He throws the sixer down in the snow with one hand, leaps over the bank, takes the lid, throws the lid down like he's going to hit it. And he hit it. And the lid decided no. <laughs> I'm not going. <laughs> Gravity had decided that the good old boy was. There are parts to the levee that are nice hills to sled on. There are other parts where it just basically drops off to your death. He didn't think that one through. Which was maybe why the lid stopped and said, I'm not going to die for you. Because all of a sudden the lid stops, he keeps going and falls straight down. He disappears. His friends thought this was great. I thought it was great. And then all you can hear him say, oh, that's far. <laughs> and then, oh, that's cold. <laughs> Not really dressed for success when it came to sled riding or lid riding, I guess is the more appropriate term. They did not have gloves and mittens and they did not have big snow coats and parkas and they did not have the pants on. Uh, they were not dressed for success. Not dressed for success. What you wear really matters, doesn't it, in your experience? What you, what you wear matters. 
me. Those of you who like action movies, you're familiar with that scene. Normally it's towards the end of the movie where the hero has to go out and win the day. And so there's this 45 second montage of them getting dressed for battle. And the, and the music, and he pulls on the gloves, and he throws on the belt, and you see him grabbing the sword, and all, all this intense because we're going to go out and we're going to slay the monster. So we have to get dressed to go slay the monster, right? Because you want to, you want to, you dress, you dress for success, right? Let me ask you a question. What do you wear if you're going to save the world? What do you wear if you're going to save the world? There's probably a few popular options right now that are floating around, pending on what your worldview and your priority is. Say, hey, if I'm going to save the world, if the world needs me, the world needs me, this is how I'm going to show up. Okay, this is, what, and I think one of them is the pop idol, right? And so, and so, you know, we've got our, we've got our fancy shirt, we've got our fancy skinny jeans. Nah, these aren't mine. <laughs> these are not mine. This, you don't even want to really try to make the picture, do you? That's the last saver you want to see walking down the sidewalk. Me and these. And, and I have to be honest, this shirt is a shirt that I've never, ever worn. Um, it's wrinkly because that's cool, right? Um, I bought this at Banana Republic like probably 20 years ago, believing that someday it would happen. <laughs> and maybe when Jesus comes back and he shrinks me, it will. <laughs> but, but there's the pop. Write that down. Write that down. Outfit number one. If you're going to save the world, maybe you could be a pop idol. You just harness all the glory and the attention and its spotlights and its fireworks and its smoke machines. Dude, you got to be the pop idol. You got you to gotta grab the glory. Right? Maybe, maybe there's another one. Maybe there's another outfit. You got to be the mighty warrior, right? You got to be the general that marches into Rome or into Jerusalem. You have to command the forces because he, whoever has the biggest stick wins, right? And for a lot of countries and a lot of people, it's all about what? Commanding military might. That's, that's how you save the world. That's what the world needs. The world needs bigger guns so that we can keep the world safe from the big guns. Yeah. So may, maybe the mighty warrior, that, that, that's, that's what we need. Because there's glory and there's power. But maybe, nah, maybe it's the successful CEO. That, that's, that's how you dress to save the world. Right? That's how you dress. You can run the boardroom. You can manipulate your enemies. You can manage. You can lead. Commanding presence. Power ties. You guys remember power ties from the early 90s? Yeah, all about the power ties. Yeah. Is, is, that, is this how you dress if you're going to save the world? You're going to be a successful CEO. Those three ideas of glory, power, might, were really what drove um, the ancient Near East, the Greeks, the Romans. That's what you need. And, and, and whoever commanded those things will build big statues to them to commemorate glory and to commemorate power and to commemorate might and strength. So is that what you wear if you're going to save the world? When Jesus got dressed, and he says, you know what? I need to go save the world now. How did Jesus dress? What did he put on? I think there's a fourth outfit. It's the house slave. Write that down. Jesus says, I'm going to go save the world now. And I'm going to go do it as a slave. I'm setting down glory. I'm setting down might. I'm setting down power. 
I'm not going to do any of those things. Jesus says, I'm going to save the world. I'm going to do it like a slave. Apparently to Jesus, slaves serve the gospel best. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Throughout our season leading up to uh, Resurrection Sunday, we're going to look at different pockets in in the book of Philippians. This week we're going to look at um, Jesus and his humility. We're going to look at how the apostle Paul embodied those things in his own life. We're going to look at how those things then are placed on our shoulders. That we should have that same mind, that same attitude as Jesus did. But let's start with getting an understanding of Jesus. How he came and what he challenges us to. Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 11. Let me read for you. Philippians chapter 2. I'm going to start reading in verse 6. I'll read all the way down through verse 11. You can follow up on the screen. Rand's already got it ready to go. He's like, move it, big guy. Though he was in the form of God, Jesus did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. We'll come back and talk about that. But emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men. Being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Key is in that verse 7. By taking the form of a servant. For Jesus, slaves serve the gospel best. Not coming in glory like a pop idol. Not coming in force like a victorious warrior. Not coming with power like a successful CEO. Jesus says, no. If you're going to save the world, then you need to become a slave. Why don't we uh, drill down on that this morning? What are some characteristics uh, of a servant or a slave? If you just wanted to write things off to the side on your notes, an important word is the word total. Total. A slave had total dependence on their master for their very livelihood. Where they're going to sleep, what they're going to wear, what they're going to eat. Totally dependent. On the master, totally dependent for their agenda, their plans. There was no slave that woke up, you know what? I'm going to set my own agenda today. Master, I appreciate all that you've done for me, but today it's a me day. I'm going to do a me thing today. No, 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 no. A slave is totally dependent on the master for the agenda. What's going to happen today? What's going to happen the next day? They don't look to themselves, which is really going to clash with our American bootstrap culture. I pull myself up. I do it myself. There is no existence outside of the relationship with their master. They're totally dependent on the master. Further, there's total devotion. They're completely devoted to their master. There are no, I don't have one master on Monday and another master on Tuesday and I don't have this master on Sunday and that master on Friday. There's only one master. In one of my big expensive books that I have in my library that my wife doesn't like me buying because you have to mortgage the house every time. Um, It says this, a slave, one who is solely committed to another. Slaves are duty bound only to their owners or masters. For those to whom total allegiance is pledged. Pledging allegiance. That's what Jesus picked up in Matthew chapter 6. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You can't have two masters. Amen. This coming Saturday... Uh, We're going to have a seminar here. Rose has been prepping months and months and months 
for this seminar. And Rose hates the fact that I have drawn everyone's attention to Rose right now. Rose is hoping there's a way that she can teach this seminar without her actually being on the stage to teach it. Uh, she's just across the table kind of person. But what we've been working on is, is crafting uh, a morning where all the things that we value are kind of set before us. And we can learn how to prioritize what do we value most and what is worth the most. Because not all things are equal. Not all things are equal. For the slave, it was total devotion to that one master. You can't have two. Is this how we understand Jesus? Is this how we see Jesus? If we can imagine him walking through the countryside, is he going forward as a slave? Enslaved himself to the will of the Father. Enslaved himself to the purpose of the kingdom and the gospel. Here's three scenes. Let's unpack this together. Let me just as an example, three scenes. I know you're not helping me out, buddy. I'm trying my best that I can. I'm doing my best. Here's three scenes. Just in your notes, you might want to reflect on these a little bit later, uh, just to meditate on them, but I want you to see Jesus as slave. The first one's in the garden. Matthew 26. You have to remember that from a perspective, he's just uh, had the feast uh, with the disciples. They've sat around the last table. They've left Jerusalem. They've walked down the valley. They're coming up into the Mount of Olives where he meditates. He has times of reflection over the last three years. And here's this last time he gathers here in the garden. His disciples have all fallen asleep. He's walked forward alone. And this is what he has to say. Going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed saying, My father... If it's possible, fill up this cup. Let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as what I will, but as you will. So, Father, for the sake of the gospel, you have asked me to do this thing. I need to take upon myself all of the wrath that humanity has accumulated all of their deception, all of their disobedience, all of the brokenness that they have incurred throughout all of their years. You have asked me, Father, to take that upon myself, which means I need to be tortured to the point of death to share this good news. Father, is there any other way but your will, not my will? What you have planned, not what I have planned. What your agenda is, not what my agenda is. Last week, we learned that a good servant invests in the master's interests. Jesus is going to fully and completely invest his life, his death, in the father's interests. Scene one. Scene two, just before that, the dinner. Now, for the disciples, this is all about Passover. This is about celebrating Passover. It's like another annual Seder. This is great. We're going to reenact the Exodus. We're going to remember God's deliverance. We're going to pass cups. We're going to break bread. This is a great time. We've done it every year. Jesus had a completely different agenda. He was going to turn this into a teachable moment. In the middle of the whole thing, he gets up and he shocks them and wrecks them to their core. This is in John 13. Let me read it for you. Verses 4 through 6. Jesus rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. He poured water into a basin and he began to wash the disciples' feet to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. When he came to Simon, Peter said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Okay, washing guests' feet was very common in house. If you lived in a household where there was lots of entertaining and lots of hospitality, it's a very common practice. House slave by the front door, people show up, they sit down, the house slave washes off their feet. Dude, this is all the age of what? Sandals and mud and dirt. And so it was just a generous act of hospitality. That you'd sit down and then the house slave would come over and wash your feet. That's what they would do, Okay. The host didn't do that. The family didn't do that. 
Who did it? The house slave did it. And so for Jesus in that moment, in the middle of dinner, as he is hosting this Seder, as he is serving as the lead teacher through this moment, for him to get up, to take off his rabbi garment and to put on the clothing of a slave and then to go to each one of the disciples and say, hey, I'm going to wash your feet. I'm washing your feet. It wrecks Peter so much. He's like, hey, 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 you don't wash my feet. You don't wash my feet. You're, you're the master. You're the master. And then he goes on to say, I have set you an example that you should therefore do what I have done. Third scene. Third scene. On the road. This is probably a few weeks before the Last Supper. A few... Uh, uh, somewhere outside of Jerusalem, they're on their way walking. How many of you have been coaches for sporting events, like at high school, elementary school, and you had to deal with parents? Okay, have you had to deal with parents? Or you led something where you had communication from parents, and parents would come up to you, and they have great intentions for their kids. Mostly, hey, why isn't my kid starting? Right, that kind of conversation. Okay, Jesus has this moment with a mom who thinks that her kid should be starting. In essence, because they believe that what Jesus is about to do is he's going to go into Jerusalem. And he's going to usher in an entire new earthly kingdom in that moment, meaning we're going to oust the religious institution that's currently there. And he's going to oust the Romans because after all, Jesus can do all this cool power stuff. Like he can make bread and he can bring people back to life. And so clearly we're going to oust the Romans. So Jesus is going to do this new thing. So mom has got two sons. Okay, James and John. Mom comes up to Jesus and says, hey, can my kids start? As in, when you come into the kingdom, glory and power for my boys, right? Listen to, let me read it for you. This is in Matthew chapter 20. I'm going to read 20 through 28. Matthew 20, 20 through 28. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons. And kneeling before him, she asked him, saying, hey. He says to her, what do you want, mom? Mom says, say uh, that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right and one at your left in your kingdom. Jesus answered, uh, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? They said, oh, yeah, we can drink it. We can handle it. We can handle the glory. We can handle the power. We can handle the might. Because Jesus, they think, is going to go usher in a new kingdom. And so he's going to sit on a throne. And when you sit on a throne, your top counselors and guides and, 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 and people of power, one's at your left and one's at your right. So mom wants to know, hey, can my boys, my boys, good for the glory, right? Good for the power. Can, can they sit next to you? And Jesus, can you drink my cup? Now Jesus is referring to the cup of wrath. And he says, hey, you, you, you will drink it. You just don't realize it yet. But look what he goes on to say. He said to them, verse 23, You will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. Now, what's Jesus talking about? He's talking about this moment when he's going to be enthroned. When is Jesus enthroned? And when is he inaugurated into his new kingdom? What's the moment? When next in the story do you see Jesus, someone at his left and someone at his right? It's at the cross, right? Yeah, because as far as the gospel writers are concerned and the apostles, they knew that was the moment it starts. He is high and lifted up. The crown is upon his head. It even says king of kings over the top. And he's got one on his left and one on his right. Emblems of the new kingdom to come. But Jesus says, hey, those spots aren't reserved for you. But he goes on to describe this power mongering that mom is guilty of. Verse 25, Jesus called to them and said, you know the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Because, hey, you guys have looked around. You've seen how people grab power. 
That's not how we do things in our kingdom. I didn't come that way. I did not come to be served. I have come to serve. I didn't come dressed like that. I put on the clothes of a house slave. How, how, how does Jesus do this? Because, boy, this really grates in our being and in our soul. And, boy, this is nowhere in our culture. What is it that Jesus did to help him do this? If we go back to Philippians chapter 2, I think we see him making two intentional decisions. So let's go back to Philippians chapter 2. I'm going to, again, read verses 6 and 7 and 8. And let's see if you can pick up on things that he intentionally did. Philippians chapter 2, 6 through 8. Though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, being found in human form. He humbled himself, by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. What are the two things? Did you see it? What's the first thing he did? He emptied himself. He humbled himself. Let's unpack those two. Write down the first one. He emptied himself. What does that mean? He emptied himself. Imagine a pitcher. We're going to empty the pitcher. We're going to take all that out. We're going to set all that down. Okay? Jesus didn't leverage all of his capacity as God, but he became man. He came down to our level. Illustration. NFL linebacker goes outside to play peewee ball with the kids in the neighborhood. Okay? Okay? Just imagine. They, hey, do you come out and play with us? Absolutely. I want to come out and play football. He sounds like Arnold Schwarzenegger, too. Okay? And, and he, he hears this, this giant lion. He's huge. He's like eight feet tall, and he weighs 300 pounds, and he's raw muscle. It's this massive guy, okay? Kids are like this big, and he's like this big. Is he going to leverage all that he is and can do in that little peewee game? What's he going to have to do? If he's not going to kill him, right? He's going to have to set some of that down. Is he going to let them push him over? Yeah, he will. Is he going to let them run by him? Yeah, he will. Is he going to get down on his knees and push and strain so hard and they push? Yeah, yeah, he's going to let him do all those things. He's going to empty himself. Now, does he stop being an NFL linebacker? Does he stop that? No, he doesn't at any time. Does he stop that? But he's going to empty himself. He's going to limit who and what he does. Most of us ignore servanthood so we can play God in our lives. Hey, everyone pay attention to me. Hey, everyone look at me. Hey, everyone look what I can do. We set aside servanthood so we can play God. Jesus set down Godhood so he could become our slave. He empties himself. You see that in the garden when he was being arrested. He let them chain him. He let them lead him away. Peter tried to take things in his own hands, right? He, he tried to do this thing. Remember that? Peter reaches for the sword, hacks off an ear. What did Jesus say in response? Don't you realize if I wanted to, I could call legion upon legion of angels in this moment. That's not how my kingdom operates. I didn't come dressed like that. He empties himself. Did he cease to be God? No, not at all. For Jesus, slaves serve the gospel best. What does that look like for us? If we're to think about, if I want to be a servant like Jesus was a servant, a house slave to the gospel like Jesus was, what, what might that look like for us? Um, setting down our plans, our agendas, our pride, stop playing God. In our marriages, how do we serve our spouse at work? How do we serve our employer? Setting down our safety. Gosh, how did we become such safety addicts? A leper comes up to Jesus. Heal me. And it says Jesus grabs a hold of him, heals him. Jesus violates social etiquette, violates health code etiquette. Jesus was not social distancing in that moment. 
He is creating a kingdom moment and restoring this person in his entirety, in his wholeness. Jesus was not concerned about his safety. So it's beautiful as you read back how Christians in the face of pandemics in the past have charged into death, unconcerned with what might happen to them. Why? Because they know what's going to happen to them. Right? Like, oh, got to be safe. Slaves serve the gospel best. Our allegiances at times are going to have to be set down. There will be times when being a good American and a good follower of Jesus will not align. What it means to be a good American and what it means to be a good Christian are going to part ways. Maybe they have parted ways. I'm okay with that. But you can't have two masters. He emptied himself. What was the second one? Do you remember? He humbled himself. Let's write that one down too, please. He humbled himself. He humbled himself. If emptying means I'm going to set something down, humbling means I'm going to pick something up. Okay? He gets underneath what God is doing. Humility means being obedient to. He learned obedience, says in the book of Hebrews. Obedience to the point of death. Obedience, death on a cross, in fact. You're going to pick up the good news for God's glory. Good and faithful is humble. Last week we talked about the servant that was worthless and wicked. They put themselves first. They put their agenda first. They put their self-preservation first. You can go back and listen to that if you didn't have a chance to be here last week. But Jesus was humble, meaning I'm going to do what's been asked of me. The scene in the garden, your will be done. How are we supposed to pray? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. There's a lot of Christians out there who don't feel like that prayer is applicable to Christians. Like that was just Jesus teaching Jews how to pray. I'm like, really? Really? Like you can do that? Like when Jesus teaches you how to pray, you can just take that one prayer and just set it aside? Like, but that doesn't count? Oh yeah, God likes it a whole lot more if I use my own words my own way. Oh. Your kingdom come, your will be done. The dinner scene, he sets off this one garment so he can put another garment on. Do you think they go together pretty well? I have to empty something before I can fill it with something else. My challenge to you, do it Jesus' way. Empty yourself. Humble yourself. Or God will do it. Have you ever been humbled by God? Have you ever been emptied by God? Uh, one of my sons, asked, we were on our way to church today, and he asked me, he says, hey, was it Jacob that wrestled with God? I said, yeah, Jacob wrestled with God. Said, yeah, that's a good job. That's right. Spot on. He's like, why? I'm like, I don't know. It didn't make sense to me either. It's just like... <laughs> Like, didn't he know that it was God? I'm like, no, I don't think he came in all of his glowing. I don't think he had wings or shining. It's like, hey, I'm God. You want to wrestle? And he's like, yeah, that'll be fun. I want to wrestle with God. No, no, no. He just showed up as a guy, just, and they started wrestling. Because up until this point, all Jacob had done was wrestle and leverage for his own growth, his own well-being, his own empire, whatever he could do to power and glory and strength. That's what Jacob was all about. Until he wrestled someone who was more glorious and more powerful and more mighty. And this is in that moment that God displaced his hip. Can you imagine? I mean, my wife can walk you through this as a physical therapist. You're talking about a, this joint, okay, which is not designed to come apart. He wrestled with God. And then he walked with a limp the rest of his life. You don't have to walk with a limp. You don't have to. Each morning you can say, you know what? I'm going to put on 
Humility, so I'm going to empty myself. God, I'm going to set down my agenda. I'm going to set down my plans and my purposes. God, I'm setting those things down. I'm going to pick up and put on obedience to you. I'm going to, I'm going to do that. I'm choosing to do that. God, help me where I'm not doing that. I think there's a couple challenges to all of this. I mean, we live in a culture that does not glorify servanthood. It glorifies glory. It glorifies power. It glorifies might. So if I'm going to go save the world, Paul, you need to pick something better than being a servant. You need to dress like that. That's what you need to chase after. After all, that's the selfie culture, right? Look at me. Like me. See me. Yeah, so the water that you swim in is opposite of what Jesus is calling us to. You're going to feel that tension externally. But if I've got to be honest, I, I feel it internally too. Because I want glory. I want power. I want strength. I want to be able to lead from up here, look down. Jesus says, no, I came from up here and I went down here. One of the things I keep coming back to, we teach it in our open house, teach it with the leadership. Our church culture is a leadership culture of downward mobility, not upward mobility. The paradox is the higher you go in leadership, the truth is the lower you actually go. You go down. You don't go up. Because our goal is Jesus. Jesus went down. And he came dressed to work. The work of a slave. So I have to constantly confront that. Uh, if you see in, in that passage, it says it's... Uh, in Philippians chapter 2, 6, 7, and 8, not to be grasped. Equality with God, not to be grasped. That's a reference back to the garden. That's what Adam and Eve did. To be like God, they took something. They took what God told them not to take. Okay, so that idea, when you see taking, that's a reference back to that broken, that, that, that corrupt part of us, the part that's gone really wrong. And it wants that. It wants to take things it's not supposed to take. Adam and Eve took the fruit. Abram and Sarah, when they couldn't have a, a child of God's promise, what? Took Hagar. Took matters into their own hands. Israel, when Israel wanted a king, took Saul as king. That did not work out well. I'm not going to take it. What do slaves do? Do slaves take things? Slaves receive things. Slaves receive things. So we got to be honest about that tension. Next week, Real excited that uh, some of our global partners, uh, Teo and Bree McCumba, are going to be here. Uh, Teo survived the Rwandan genocide in the 90s, where a million Rwandans were murdered and slaughtered in 100 days. And he got out of the country alive. His, his family was murdered. He got out alive, gave his allegiance to Jesus, has now gone back to the country. Okay? to share the love of Jesus with those who killed the ones he loved. So is Teo going with power and might and glory? What is, what is, how is he dressed? Teo goes dressed like a slave. That's what we do. So please make a habit of, um, make a ha number one, make a habit of going to church. Also make it, make it intentional and be with us next Sunday. Okay. This passage was a hymn. They would sing it. They would chant it to one another. How do we, how do, we do this? I mean, how we dress for the day communicates our plans. Am I looking for glory? Am I looking for power? Am I looking for might? Or am I dressing myself with humility? At the bottom of your notes, a closing question. Do you need a wardrobe check? Artist, would you come up, please? Do you need a wardrobe check? Meaning this. If Jesus stayed the night at your house and it was time to go, in the work, go to work in the morning, 
Would Jesus have anything to wear? Or as Jesus looks to your wardrobe, does he see a lot of glory hanging up and power hanging up and might hanging up? Are those the things that you have covered yourself with? Are those the things that you chase after? Or would Jesus find a soul covered in humility, ready to serve at the drop of a hat, ready to help whenever the gospel calls, looking for ways to share gospel and live out gospel, that there is better news? Because believe me, Jesus proved it. Slaves serve the gospel best. This season leading up to Resurrection Sunday is supposed to cut a little bit. It's supposed to be a little confrontational to our spirit and our soul. It's kind of designed to, to thrust our brokenness in front of us. So it's good and right to have a discipline of confession and repentance, regularly coming before Jesus and saying, Hey, you're awesome. Man, have I screwed up. Help me. Would you stand with me? If you were with us on Wednesday evening at our prayer gathering to begin the Lent season, we prayed this together. And I'd like us to do it this morning as well. I'm going to read through this prayer first, just so you can hear the words and, and hear how, uh, how it bends and, and where it goes. But then let's together use these words. Let me read them first for you. Most merciful God, we confess that we've sinned against you in thought and word and deed by what we've done, by what we've left undone. We've not loved you with our whole heart and we've not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will, walk in your ways. To the glory of your name, amen. Let's all read this together, would we? Let's make this our prayer. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name, amen. Thank you for sharing your time with us, and we'd love for the journey to continue. If you're a guest, would you consider reaching out to us? We would love to come alongside and encourage you in any way that we can. If you're someone who's joined us today, and you are desperately reaching to find hope wherever you can, again, Jesus came that we would find hope. You can find hope today. If you want to send us a short note, a member of our hope team would reach out quickly, promptly, to come alongside and see what we can do to encourage you in whatever storm you might find yourself in. That's why Jesus came. That's why we're here. Jesus said there's two ways to live your life. And a wise man, a wise woman, builds their life on Jesus' instructions. God bless.